Everything has an end, and everything comes to an end, even death itself. So go the rhymes of Afghan history, for the year is 1747, and the mighty Iranian empire of Nada Afshar came to an abrupt end with his assassination. His untimely departure carried with him a premonition of death and set in motion a series of events that would become the epic drama that is the history of Afghanistan. Welcome to the Caspian Report series on the Graveyard of Empires. Groping through the unfriendly dark, everyone in the vicinity of South Asia realized that there would be severe consequences for the death of Nader Shah. The immediate fallout would be as cruel and ruthless as the dead monarch himself. The Pashtun tribes in Kandahar were particularly anxious for the wave of chaos. As such, a grand assembly of the tribes was called to elect a king who would defend the Pashtun homelands. Warlords, princes, nobles, merchants, scholars, clerics, Anyone who was a someone was there. The assembly lasted for over a week, but no consensus was reached. Eventually, during the ninth hearing, an elderly religious mystic stepped forward and pointed to a young man standing silently in the crowd and said, There is your leader. No other has his nobility. It's that man. Ahmed, the young man's name, modestly declined and said that he was not worthy, at which point the mystic elder approached Ahmed and placed a makeshift crown on his head. The crowd fell silent and all recognized the majesty of Ahmed. Yet charisma wasn't the only quality that Ahmed possessed. At the age of 16, an even younger Ahmed commanded a contingent of about 4,000 elite horsemen under the banner of the deceased Nader Afshar of the Iranian Empire that was now crumbling. When Nader Shah was eliminated, looting had commenced among the common soldiers. Ahmed, who happened to be there that night, made his escape with a treasury of gold, gems, and the legendary Koh-i-Noor diamond, now part of the British crown jewels. At the time of the Pashtun assembly, the young and modest Ahmed was perhaps the most powerful man in the crowd. Either way, Ahmed had the charm, muscle, and purse. And upon taking the throne, it was customary for a king to proclaim a royal title. Ahmed chose for himself Juri i Juran meaning the Pearl of Pearls. The Pashtun tribal leaders had come away from the assembly believing that they had elected a temporary king in the face of a common threat, and as soon as the danger passed, the Pashtuns would resume their usual internal power plays and dissolve the seat of the Jurani king. Little did they know that Ahmad Shah would not only defend the Pashtun homelands, but go as far as to establish one of the largest empires of its time. However, in tribal Pashtun culture, could not simply order his peers with impunity. The council members who served the king had their own prestige to consider, and the nobles who served the council members had their own reputations to uphold, while the patrons who served the nobles had their own honor at stake, and on and on it goes. In this game of politics, leadership was constantly being negotiated. So in practice, simply appointing a person to an office didn't grant him any tangible authority, a great deal depended on social qualities, such as skill, age, grace, marriage, wealth, etc. Owing to the social considerations, it took Ahmed Shah years to set up a network of loyal and competent followers, but the conflict they prepared for with the Iranians never came. And each year, the sovereignty of the Jurani king eroded steadily but assuredly. Ahmed Shah needed a war. That was the whole point of his kingly seat. Taking lessons from political dynamics, he decided to strike the Mughal Empire and the Indian realms. The deceased Nader Shah had already decimated most of the standing armies in the periphery during his military campaigns, leaving South Asia vulnerable and ripe for conquest. Plus, the South Asian kingdoms were abundantly rich with gems, gold, and other valuables. From Kandahar, Ahmed Shah departed with a force of 40,000 troops and invaded the Mughal Empire, sacking towns along the way. The Durrani king repeatedly attacked the Mughal and Indian states over the next two decades, which paved the way for the rise of the Sikhs in Punjab. When he wasn't invading the Indian subcontinent, Ahmed Shah was busy consolidating power over the Khorasan area, capturing the cities of Kabul, Herat, and so forth. By successfully striking at his foes, Ahmed Shah earned not only prestige, but also gained a steady stream of revenue, 
allowing him to further expand his network of followers. As the Durrani Empire grew in size and power, it incorporated territories that were inhabited by other ethnicities, such as Tajiks, Uzbeks, Turkmen, Hazaras, and many others. Like all subjects, Ahmed Shah taxed the people, drafted them into his armies, but also shared the spoils of war across his realm. At its peak, in 1761, the Durrani Empire stretched from northwestern India to eastern Iran, all the way up to the southern portion of Central Asia. In addition to his military prowess, Ahmed Shah had a firm grasp of the unwritten codes of conduct to which the Pashtuns subscribed. He threw lavish feasts, donated generously to charity, composed epic poetry, etc. It is said that Pashtuns fight for three things, land, gold, and women. If that's true, then Ahmed Shah delivered on all three. In short, the Durrani king was admired by his people and feared by his enemies. He unified the Pashtun tribes more than anyone ever had before. The large tribes reconciled their differences, while the various ethno-linguistic groups began seeing themselves as part of a greater collective. It was the beginning of a national sense of belonging known as Afghaniyat. Subjects of Ahmed Shah began referring to themselves as Afghans, a term that superseded language and ethnicity. However, Ahmed Shah had not created a country in the modern sense. There was no precise border, no common currency, and no standing army. At the time and place, a country could not have existed in Afghanistan, for the geography was too imposing and the technology to overcome it did not exist yet. The scope of the king's decree was restrained to the major cities, Kabul, Kandahar, Herat, Mazar-e-Sharif, and Peshawar. All five cities brought their own distinct qualities. Herat was the city of learning, art, and commerce. Kandahar acted as the military and conservative capital of the Pashtuns. It was also the seat of the king. Peshawar was the breadbasket of Afghanistan, while Mazar-e-Sharif was the city of religious and historical shrines. At the center was Kabul, a confluence of all Afghan beliefs and identities. Yet one day's walk in any direction of the cities and the deeds of the king did not exist. In the countryside of Afghanistan, power belonged to whoever possessed the ability to tax and draft the locals. Thousands of such autonomous villages dotted the landscape, all acting and functioning as separate political entities who had little idea of what was transpiring in the neighboring villages, let alone the larger cities. What's more is that since most Afghans lived in the countryside and not in the cities, the rural domain was, therefore, the real Afghanistan. Back then, as now, the social fabric of countryside Afghanistan affected the politics of the country. Since every village was largely self-sufficient, there was a strong sense of autonomy. Life in the countryside was conservative, deeply so. Virtually all marriages took place within the village, and the inhabitants produced their own food, water, housing, and clothing. They dug their own irrigation, plowed their own fields, and provided their own security. When a dispute erupted, the village elder stepped in, and when the dispute was of complex nature, the village council intervened. Religious rites and ceremonies were performed by the local mullah, who was essentially a person who could read and write and had read the Quran, and thus had a basic understanding of the rudiments of religious law. If someone was sick, needed a haircut, or some other daily service, there was always a local in the vicinity who provided such work. Meanwhile, the nomads who traveled between villages provided for gossip and news. Most of these activities took place without money. Coins weren't widespread, thus an economic exchange occurred by the barter of goods and services. In other words, Afghan villages were self-sufficient. There was no need for the government services and none existed. The concept of king and country was abstract and meant very little for rural Afghans. At the age of 50, Ahmed Shah passed away, but not before casting a monumental shadow over Afghan history. No other ruler managed to emulate him, yet the failure to live up to the legacy of Ahmed Shah also laid the bedrock of many more conflicts to come. Thank you for watching this Caspian Report special. Credit goes to our top contributors on Patreon for giving us the tools to produce original content like this. If you want to learn more or gain access to perks, visit patreon.com forward slash Caspian Report.